Okay, everybody, I'm going to start. Um, I have no objection to your eating, getting more food, getting up, going to the bathroom, anything like that. Just please, no telephone calls. So the name of my keynote presentation is Don't Worry, Be Happy, the second screen 4K IP 2014 NAB show versus the real world. Uh, one of the contradictions at NAB, right up front, we have the Patriots jet team. It's nice to note that the Patriots fly Russian MiGs. <laughs> A couple of questions. Should unclothed women be used to sell equipment at the NAB show? And I am pleased to report that my colleagues of the uh, male heterosexual persuasion say, no, it should not be done. But there's a different question that there is not unanimity about, which is, um, does it in fact attract a crowd? So here's the scenario. At Atomos, they had these unclothed but painted women, and they were raffling off equipment. There were no women around. They gathered a very large crowd for the raffle. And they got the crowd all enthused. And then the unclothed woman came out to choose the numbers for the raffle, who was going to win. And then when the raffle was over, um, people could pose with the unclothed woman. So here is what it looked like. Everyone left once the raffle was over. So I would say that it does not even attract a crowd. Uh, here is not from NAB, but from a little earlier, saying that second screen users shun live TV sync, meaning yes, people are checking their email and going on Facebook and doing all kinds of other stuff while they're watching TV but they are not necessarily going to anything that has to do with the TV program. Nevertheless, at the right here is one of the startups. It's my favorite name of a startup, uh, Tomorrow-ish. And the idea is that this is a second screen DVR. So you not only record the program, but you also record uh, any comments that people made on the program, like, oh, wow, this is really cool. But of course, you can't comment to the commenters at the same time. But Anyway, looking at some Nielsen data, traditional TV viewing per month, 152 hours. Uh, time shifted, 12 and a half hours. Uh, eMarketer says that about 16% did real-time socializing about TV shows. So we're talking about roughly 1.2% of audience time as the entire market that Tomorrow-ish has to work with at the moment. But that's still enough. That's you know millions of people. They can make money on that. There's no problem. Distractions are not new. At the left, you see somebody who's using not only a second screen, but also a third screen, but doesn't yet have a 16 to 9 TV. Uh, at the right, we see somebody from the 1950s, and she's reading the newspaper while she's writing, uh, watching TV. Here is Deborah McAdams in TV Technology saying she thinks Aereo and the FCC increasingly will be irrelevant because the Internet is be modifying behavioral models faster than any institution can keep up with, much less harness. Uh, and this is what we're hearing all the time. The internet is taking over and broadcasting is dead. So sure enough, here is Convergence Magazine, and there's the headline, Broadcasting is Dead, Long Live Digital Choice. This is when that headline appeared <laughs> in March 1997. Here are some more recent headlines. These are all from this month from the New York Times, May 8th. Uh, Fox ad revenue up 30 uh, percent. CBS posts 6 percent gain in profits. NBC buying the Olympics out to 2032. Plain TV continues to be strong. You may recall the Gil Scott Heron record, the revolution will not be televised. Well, it seems the television viewer will not be revolutionized. <laughs> This was another record audience for the Super Bowl, depending on how the numbers are counted, uh, but an average of roughly 112 million U.S. viewers, 115 million for the halftime show. Um, the largest live stream ever for sports, roughly 500,000 people. Well, that's half a percent of the TV viewers, and that's the largest streamed sports event ever. That's up 4% over 2013, and the average duration up to 48 minutes now. That's up 25%. By the way, the stadium was blacked out from the live stream lest it crash it. 
Verizon Wireless proudly announced that it served 1.9 terabytes in MetLife Stadium. Uh, and they did that for roughly six hours. So 1.9 terabytes divided by 21,600 seconds is about 700 megabits per second. Divide that by 80,000 fans. And we're talking a whopping eight kilobits per fan. Uh, not a lot, so throw in a few other carriers, maybe we're talking 12 kilobits. Here is a Nielsen report, the URL is up at the top, uh, you may not be able to catch it right now, but this will be posted on shubincafe.com. Um, all of this is out of the Nielsen report, the figures at the bottom are for weekly viewing, at the top I've made the monthly, again 164 hours and 39 minutes of TV viewing per month, watching video on the internet, 6 hours and 20 seconds. Here is uh, another headline. This one's out of Display Central uh, from Pete Putman, and he's talking about how he was hit with one of the bad winter storms this year, and so he lost internet service, he lost cable service. All he could do was watch antenna TV. And in fact, broadcast TV via antenna is still going strong, increased in 2013 over 2012, um, Nielsen said it's up slightly, GFK said it's up a lot, but then if you read the GFK blog, they say, well, don't trust our figures. But at NAB, we have a new TV receiving antenna being shown because this is still an important business. That's the Televez uh, DigiNova. Here's a, another recent headline. This is May 17th. Um, from advanced television, U.S. pay TV subscribers on the rise. And uh, cable is losing fewer people, and satellite and telcos are increasing. So this is from Ad Week, the end of April. Um, current viewing habits, and the black bars on both sides are the young people, the 18 to 34-year-olds. So we see that streaming, Netflix, yeah, you know, they're doing um, almost as good as the History Channel. Well, maybe not quite that good. Um, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox doing vastly superior to any of the streaming services, except that in the 18 to 34 demographic, Netflix is doing better than any of the broadcast networks, but not that much better than the broadcast networks. Brand awareness, down at the bottom, the black circles are, again, for the 18 to 34 demographic. So we see that the network awareness for all the networks is in the 90s. Uh, the streaming awareness for Redbox, down to 25%. Uh, Amazon Prime, 40%. Hulu Plus, 60%. Netflix, yeah, doing better, uh, 89%. Um, but in the uh, demographic of the 18 to 34 year olds, Fox is doing better than Netflix. Here's another thing, film is dead. What was the number one movie of 2013? Hunger Games Catching Fire. What was it shot on? Film, which is dead of course. <laughs> and uh, also the number five movie and the number nine movie of 2013 were shot on film. Uh, so what do we have at the most technologically advanced, supposedly, booth at NAB, uh, Blackmagic Design? We have the Sintel Film Scanner, $30,000 for a scanner for 35 millimeter film at this high-tech booth. I to point out that they did Blackmagic, therefore, did what they always did, which is to take the thing and sell it for 10% of what it used to cost. Yeah. And maybe it's still good, maybe it isn't, but, you know. Did you all hear Eric? He says that what Blackmagic did was they took the thing and sold it for 10% of what it used to cost. Here's another sign that appeared at NAB, uh, SDI must die. This was gigantic. It was plastered all over the Synergy booth. There were many other booths saying the same thing. Uh, yeah, probably SDI is going to die someday. Everything is going to die someday. The universe is going to die someday. But pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their backs. The first 1125 line HDTV camera, that's the total lines, what we 
call today, 1080 line HD is 1125 total. It appeared in New York in 1973, and I used it then. Uh, the people, even in the 1980s, who got into the HDTV business are all no longer in the HDTV business. Uh, remember a few years ago at NAB, stereoscopic 3D was what we needed. Let's go back a little farther, 1983 NAB, teletext in the U.S. was the most important thing. The big question was, are we going to do North American broadcast teletext standard or world system teletext? Anybody remember the D6 recorder, which I'm showing an image of there, uh, about the size of this lectern? So today is May 21st. What happened on May 21st? These billboards appeared all over the place saying the world was going to end two years ago, uh, three years ago, sorry. And so then there were these follow-up billboards. <laughs> So be happy, the world didn't end, and your world is not in imminent danger of ending. Yes, we're moving to IP. Um, yes, we're moving to different technologies. You don't have to make that move immediately. That said, there is something quite important about IP distribution, and uh, it is that it's broadly available. So here's an image of a particular television production truck. This is all mobile videos, Titan, which I work in all the time. I don't know if you can make out the figures, but it's about 60 feet from one end to the other and expands out to more than uh, 16 feet of width. Um, let's try a thought experiment. If we could reduce all of the electronics on this truck to a single chip, how big would the truck be? So while you're thinking about that, let me show you another truck. Ross the equipment manufacturer has moved into the truck business. I don't mean that they have moved into the manufacturing of trucks business, although they have done that also. They have moved into the truck rental business. So they are competing with people like O Mobile Video, except they're doing it on a lower level. So this is not a truck that has 25 seats. This is a truck that has six seats. Um, but they're doing it simultaneously with something they're calling the Open Truck Initiative. So they're going to make all the blueprints freely available. They're going to make all the wiring diagrams, everything freely available. They'll do training for people. The idea being that if everybody's trucks at this level are the same, then everybody will be able to make use of technicians in the same places. Everyone will know where everything is and so on. Something to think about. So getting back to that thought experiment, how big is all mobile videos Titan if we reduce all of the electronics to a single chip? And it is the exact same size <laughs> because we have 25 people in there. Actually, they're showing 25 people, and I use the truck. It's more like 40. And they all have control surfaces that they need to use, and they all have monitoring that they need to use. And that chip is going to run really, really hot, and so it's going to need just about as much air conditioning. <laughs> But this truck business is a problem for people who are shooting sports or even concerts, and they have to travel all around the country all the time, and staff, and there's travel days, and per diem, and everything else. So what's the solution? Don't move the production staff around. So at the left is one of the control rooms at the NBC Olympics facility in Stamford, Connecticut, where they did some of the production that was going on in Sochi. The Olympics were happening in Russia. The production was in Connecticut. At the right is something that was not at NAB this year, but was at the International Broadcasting Convention last fall. It's called an SVS switcher. The control surface was at the convention in Amsterdam. The electronics were in Germany. The connection was by IP. And furthermore, if you have multiple control surfaces and one of them is doing a really complicated effect, then it gets more of the electronics than the other control surfaces that aren't doing a very complicated effect at the time. So very interesting use of IP. Here is what was to me the most amazing technology introduction at the show. It's a new Evert switcher, the EXE 46T. The 46T stands for 46 terabits of switching capacity, 46 terabits per second, 2,304 ports. So my question is, 
why did I have to shoot a poster of it instead of the actual device? The actual device was there and functioning. It's because the actual device was behind glass in its own room. And the reason it was behind glass in its own room was, well, for one thing, it needed 15 tons of air conditioning. For another, the noise of its fans was likened by somebody else to the sound of a DC-6. But it's an extraordinary technology. Look at the diagram at the upper right. You take four of these, you interconnect them properly, you can do 60,000 squared switching. Amazing. But at one point before the show opened, the air conditioning wasn't working so well, and so neither was the switching working so well. But coax still works. If your plant doesn't require 60,000 squared switching, or 2,300 ports, or 46 terabits per second, uh, you can get away with a standard routing switcher. At the top right is an Envision router that's 64 squared in two rack units. And you can transmit things over SDI. SDI is not dying. It's not in any imminent danger of dying. Altura had this demo of 12G SDI uh, over 60 feet of coax. And Steve Lampin, who's sitting in the second row over there at the HPA tech retreat in February, said you can go even longer. You can go considerably longer than that at 12G. Um, Expect the expected at NAB. So at the bottom left, I have the South Hall upper Tuesday morning. You could uh, fire a shotgun and not hit anyone. Outdoor exhibits Monday morning, not hit anyone. North Hall Wednesday morning, not hit anyone. Black Magic booth, there was not a moment where you could fire a pea shooter and not hit somebody. A little bit about sound acquisition. Why do I? Uh, year after year not tell you about things in sound and only about video. Well, at the Countryman booth, they were still showing video from a show that I did in 2010. Lighting. Uh, at the left is a slide from Mike Wagner's presentation on LED lighting. Extremely important. Yes, we're moving to LED. Yes, it's wonderful. It's green. It takes care of all kinds of stuff. But it can mean that two cameras can see wildly different colors from the same lighting instrument. And uh, there are different technologies that people are trying to take care of that. Also, if we use any of the technologies other than incandescent lighting, we have issues when we're shooting at higher frame rates of getting flicker. So here's a device that was introduced by Crosscast called D-Flicker to get rid of the flicker after it has been shot. This was an interesting light uh, from Flow Light. Um, it's got only three LEDs in it, three 40-watt LEDs, but it's got these very interesting diffusers, and they say if you put it down at the bottom of the psych, it gives you a nice even psych light. Lenses, Schneider introduced these lenses. They'll work on many uh, different smartphone cameras, macros, wide angles, uh, tele lenses, and so on. They give you a case for it that makes it uh, fit nicely. But why do we use smartphone cameras all the time? It's because they fit into our pockets very nicely. Well, Schneider made this nice case for the lenses. Um, but you have to carry that around. You can screw it into the phone and it gives you something to hold, um, but maybe you're not going to carry that around as much as you do your phone. This was one of the most magnificent lenses that was introduced at the show. It's an REPL mount wide zoom. It's telecentric. Um, it's optically absolutely magnificent, but its zoom range is less than two to one. Here are two new lenses that were introduced by Fujinon at the show. Uh, the one on the left is a PL mount lens for theoretically a uh, Super 35 format camera, but lots and lots of cameras are using PL mounts. I'll show more about that in a moment. And at the right is a standard B4 uh, broadcast lens. Now the B4 lens, very easy to handhold. The PL lens, kind of big and heavy for handholding. Um, so the PL lens is a 25 to 300. The B4 equivalent for that in two-thirds inch would be 12 by 9.8, going out to 117 millimeters. The uh, equivalent of the 
um, B4 lens and PL would be a 14 to 254, so pretty much the full range of the um, PL zoom and going considerably wider. But what about long zooms? What if you're doing sports or you're doing a concert or you're doing something in the Congress of the United States? Um, very common to use a long B4 lens. This is a 99 by 8.4 from Fujinon. Canon has a 100 uh, that's about the same. The PL Super 35 equivalent of that would be a 22 to 2132 lens. Does not exist. Nobody has a long zoom for a PL mount. And furthermore, let me point out that these lenses are designed for HD resolution. So a bunch of the people who have introduced what they're calling 4K cameras with PL mounts are saying, oh, no problem, just use an adapter. So in the middle, I'm showing a particular adapter. If that adapter is optically perfect, has no optical losses whatsoever, there will be a 2.6 stop light loss just for the expansion of the image from the two-thirds to the Super 35. Now, they also say that the adapter compensates for different color depths. I'll explain that in a moment. By the way, Sony has a couple of cameras, the F5 and the F55, that have a crop mode. So they'll go from what they're calling 4K to what they're calling 2K. And if you use the crop mode, then you only have to expand it by 1.4 times. And so your loss is only uh, 1.4 stops instead of 2.6 stops. So here is the standard B4 mount. It's been standardized by the uh, Broadcast Technology Association. It's S-1005A. And it has different landing places for the green, the blue, and the red. Now, you would think if this was optical that the blue should be farthest from the red, but the green is farthest from the red. And that's because it was the best that the lens manufacturers and the camera manufacturers could come up with. They got together and they said, how can we possibly make the best pictures? And this is what they came up with. Now, in the PL mount cameras, they're all using single sensors. So all of the colors have to end up in the same place. This is what's inside a typical broadcast zoom lens. There's four groups of elements. This has about 36 elements total. There's a focusing element, a magnifying element, the variator, which does the zooming, the compensator, which maintains focus while you're zooming, and then a relay uh, group that's just for getting the image and sending it to the sensor. Well, there's seven elements just in that relay group. So we're saying we're going to add another relay group behind that, and um, it's not going to affect the image at all. It's not going to make it any worse. Getting to the cameras, uh, tip of the hat to David Leitner for his presentation on cameras. At the right is something that a Spanish director of photography has been sending out. And AB 2014 was the year the camera companies discovered that we have shoulders. So everybody had shoulder mount cameras. Everybody had PL lens mounts. Everybody had rosettes. There's two basic types of rosettes, by the way. There's an Ari rosette, and there's a red rosette, and there are adapters that go between the two. Everybody had rods. Everybody was using the Vocus wooden hand grip. Uh, Grass Valley showed a prototype of what they called a 4K camera, and it had the wooden hand grip on it. And even Panasonic came out with a PL mount camera this year. So if all of those are doing the same thing, what are the differences between the cameras? Well, one big difference is imager widths. So let's take Blackmagic Design, and they have an imager width of 15.8 millimeters. And then Sony's uh, Alpha 7S has an imager width of 36 millimeters. That's more than twice um, the size of that. So at the right, I'm showing portion of a chart that Abel Cine offers on its website. Uh, the yellow part of the image is what a super 35 millimeter frame would have. The blue part of the image is what that particular camera has. They're all PL mount cameras, but the focal lengths are meaningless. The shot sizes are meaningless. Also, depth of field is inversely proportional to imager size, all else being equal. Um, sometimes it's wonderful to have a very narrow depth of field. You want to separate your talent from the background, great to have a narrow depth of field. 
But if you're shooting documentary style, you're following somebody around, you're shooting news, you want to have tremendous depth of field. Otherwise, you're going to lose stuff. So the idea that a PL mount is a wonderful thing for all cameras, not necessarily so good. Uh, by the way, Fairchild was at the show and introduced a new sensor. Very unusual that somebody would be showing just the sensor at NAB. And the optical format of that sensor is one inch. Now, we used to have lots of one inch tubes. To the best of my knowledge, there was not a single camera at NAB that was one inch format. But that's what the new sensor is. Resolution, a lot of people calling things 4K. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Connections, I'll talk more about in a moment. They're quite different. Uh, coding, file types, metadata, you've heard a bunch about, you're going to hear more about. Storage, but I just couldn't uh, avoid giving you this one little tiny thing on metadata. Um, this is General Michael V. Hayden. <laughs> Uh, by the way, the date of this I put in only April because I didn't want you to think it was a joke because it wasn't a joke, but he did do it on April 1st. So 4K, what is the meaning of 4K? The European Broadcasting Union says there's only one meaning of 4K. It's four degrees above absolute zero, <laughs> which is the temperature at which liquid helium liquefies. Um, they want you to use a small K instead of a capital K. but there are some people saying it's 4096 by 3072, or 4096 by 2048, or 4096 by 2160. A lot of people at the show were saying they had 4K cameras that were doing 3840 by 2160, which other people call Quad HD. Some people are just using the term interchangeably with UHD or ultra high definition, but 7680 by 4320, which people are calling 8K, is also ultra high definition. Uh, and ultra high definition includes potentially higher frame rate, higher dynamic range, wider color gamut, and immersive sound. Now, what is the meaning of a 4K camera? Is a single color filtered 4K sensor 4K? And the sensors at the show ranged from about 8 megapixels up to about 20 megapixels on cameras that were being called 4K. So here's a new 4K camera uh, introduced by Aja. A lot of Aja makes cameras. Um, well, we used to say Grass Valley makes cameras. Now we can say Belden makes cameras. Um, and I'll give you more of that later. But uh, here is out of the Aja brochure, and I apologize for the little dirt on there. That's from my scanner. That's not from their brochure. But they say that they have an optical low-pass filter to reduce the uh, unwanted aliasing. And my question is, how the heck do you do that? Because look at the three images on the upper right. That's what the red part of the sensor is doing, the green part of the sensor is doing, and the blue part of the sensor is doing. The red and the blue are purely 2K. So if you want to optically filter properly for those, you have a 2K low-pass. The green is Quincunx 4K. So if you want a properly optical filter for the green, you need to have a 4K optical filter. How can you do that with one sensor? You can't have two different optical low passes for a single sensor. And uh, by the way, I first showed you this slide in 2008. Um, down at the bottom, Peter Senton of what was then Thompson Grass Valley said, if the 4K cameras that were out at the time are 4K, then the Panavision Genesis and the Sony F23 are 6K. Now, it is possible to make a true 4K camera. And this is a paper that appeared on it uh, in the Simpty Journal in March of 2001. The camera was made by Lockheed Martin. That's it on the left. It's a very large camera because it's a prism camera for three sensors, each of which is larger than an IMAX film frame. Gigantic sensor. And then they used a telecentric lens to bring it down. But the MTF predictions are very similar to film, as you can see on the right there. So that's a true 4K camera. Grass Valley showed something called a 4K prototype, and a three chip, and it's prism based. And it says 4K on the outside of the camera. Uh, and at the show, I didn't know any sensor details. I have since learned that the sensors in the camera are Sensium FT sensors, which means that they are HD sensors. So there are three HD sensors configured on an HD 
prism, two-thirds inch. It's basically an HD camera just like the Viper was. Nothing wrong with that. There have been some movies like The Curious Case of Benjamin Button that were shot with the uh, Viper camera. It's absolutely fine. What I've also since learned is that Grass Valley had a different case for the camera, or at least a different paint job, and it said 6K on it because they have three 2K sensors, so you add that up and it's 6K. Um, now, you may laugh and say, well, that's ridiculous, but so effectively are the cameras that people are calling 4K now because they've got 2K red, they've got 2K blue, they've got King Kong's green, they can't do proper filtering. So the only thing 4K about the Grass Valley camera is it has 4K output and they're up converting and the fact that they have very nice sensors without any quincunx or anything and they have very nice optical filtering means conceivably they're doing a better 4K output than the cameras that are being called 4K. And because it's a two-thirds inch camera and it's prism based, it can use the B4 lenses with no light loss. Uh, whether the MTF in those lenses is good enough for 4K is another issue. By the way, another two-thirds inch three-chip camera that was introduced was the Flovel FZB3 uh, ultra high sensitivity. But other than those, we're really not much uh, new in the way of two-thirds inch chip cameras. Yes? But is it, <laughs> if the camera's not really 4K, then you don't need lenses that can do 4K. Um, you do because you wanna have enough information for the up converter to figure out what it should do to give you the 4K. But that information is not being captured by the sensors. It is because you have different sharpness that comes out of the cameras. Uh, the MTF is much higher for a uh, higher resolution lens. So why should you shoot 4K. Well, benefits for HD output, of course, if you uh, simply downconvert 4K to HD, that's a wonderful thing, assuming it's a good 4K camera. You can do reframing in post. You can do image stabilization in post. You can do easier filtering because of the oversampling. You can even do conceivably single sensor 3D. Uh, there are some advantages to that. And possibly you get some increased sharpness. Here's why down conversion is good. This is uh, a sync function. A sync function is a sine x over x function. It's the most basic filtering for digital sampling. Mm -hmm. Well, if the far end of that is HD, then you're getting zero contrast at HD. If the far end of that is 4K, then you're getting 64% contrast at HD. Big difference between zero and 64%. Why extraction is not necessarily as good, extraction was a big word at NAB this year, uh, pulling 4K, out, pulling HD out of 4K, pulling 4K out of 8K. Um, if this is a hypothetical lens and it's got very good performance at HD and not such good performance at 4K, your extracted HD could be anywhere between that HD and 4K depending on how much zooming you did. Here is a very small camera with a very large image sensor. It's the Sony Alpha 7S. Um, it can output 4K to an external recorder, so they were showing it at the Atomos booth, another reason they didn't need unclothed women there. Um, it uses a color filtered full frame sensor. Now full frame is twice the size of a super 35 millimeter film frame, but it's only 12 megapixels. So it's ultra sensitive because of its large pixels. Now, remember when you had film cameras and they had ASA or ISO 100 or 400 or something, if you had really, really sensitive film, it was ISO 800. This camera is rated at ISO 409,600. But it's because it has very few pixels, so the pixels can be very large. So here's Blackmagic Design. At the top, they introduced a digital cinematography camera called the Ursa. In the middle is their studio camera, which is sort of like a viewfinder with a lens attached. Uh, at the right is the Terranex Express. And then down at the bottom is their 4K uh, production switcher, their 4K video hub routers, and their 4K uh, deck link cards. All three of the top things put out 12G SDI. All three of the bottom things can only accept 6G SDI. So this is within a single company. You cannot connect the camera to the switcher. 
must you change to 4K? This was the UTELSAT booth broadcasting more than 5,000 TV channels, of which 500 in high definition. And hint, the other 4,500 are not 4K. <laughs> so recap on 4K, good to downconvert to HD, good for reframing in post for HD, maybe not quite as good, uh, stereoscopic 3D on one sensor, currently less sensitive. Remember, the smaller the pixels, the less sensitive. The reason I say currently is if we get enough computer power, we can use the overall sensor to uh, improve the sensitivity of the individual pixels. No long zooms for PL mount, and it takes eight times the data uncompressed because uh, if you're going from 720p to 4K, then it's eight times the number of pixels. If you're going from 1080i to 4K, first thing you have to do is deinterlace, and then it's four times the number of pixels. So it's eight times the data either way, and no connection standard even within a single uh, company. I'll talk a little bit about 4K viewing in the next session. So camera maintenance, and again, tip of the hat to David Leitner for this idea. There's the Blackmagic Studio camera, and you can see, again, it's a viewfinder with a lens attached. You're not going to do maintenance on it. If that breaks, you're not going to be able to get into it. And if you ship it back to Australia, who knows when it's going to come back to you. Uh, but look at the price at the lower left. It's 1995. How much are you paying for your spare parts kit? for your current cameras. So maybe we have to start thinking uh, that broadcast cameras are disposable, studio cameras are disposable, that if it breaks, you just replace it with another camera. Upgrade licensing. Here's uh, something that Ari is doing with the Amira. Uh, you buy the basic version, and then you're on a shoot, and you decide you need some of the extra features. You pay a temporary license fee for it. This was another camera at the show. It's a 1080p camera. Um, it's also a pair of sunglasses. It also has GPS, gyro, live streaming, extra batteries, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, all that kind of stuff. And their lowest price version, not the one with all of these features, is $199. Still has the 1080p camera. Here's another company, Smart Telecaster. They go a step beyond this. They say, well, you know, if you're going to really use that kind of stuff in broadcast, you need a two-way audio channel. So the people in the studio can say, say, how is it at that fire, Betty? Well, I'm wearing my fire retardant clothing, but it's still getting hot in here. A couple more little cameras, the Crosscast Medusa M-Cam at the <laughs> left, uh, which goes out to... 340 frames per second. It's a really, really tiny high-speed camera. And then at the right, another small camera. Marshall makes cameras. And then this was traveling around the show floor, the digital Bolex. <laughs> um, some other acquisition stuff. The thing at the left is, was just really cool and cheap. Uh, a company called Video Stitch, they were another one of the startups. They took six GoPro heroes, they mounted them in a cube, they stitched all of the images together so you have a sphere, uh, 360 degrees in any plane, and then you put on an Oculus Rift uh, virtual reality headset and you move your head around and you can see everything. It's really, really cool and it's cheap enough that it doesn't matter that it doesn't do anything other than be really, really cool. <laughs> And then at the right is the uh, Rushworks PT Mini. The woman at the right is a real woman. The woman at the left is a mannequin. There were many mannequins on stage. The real woman walked around. She walked behind the mannequins, in front of the mannequins, and the mount tracked her wherever she went. And relatively inexpensive mount, great for doing church-type production or something like that. Uh, drones. Certainly lots of drones at NAB. Privacy is just one concern. Another is the name. They're called drones. Why are they called drones? Well, maybe because they go <laughs> And then there was this news story that came out shortly after NAB that an airplane nearly hit a drone over Florida in March, which is why at the DJI booth at NAB, there was this netting. So you could not be hit by a drone that somebody was flying. Storage, Panasonic has uh, gone to ProRes. 
so that was kind of remarkable. And also for having raw output, the last thing you see on that Panasonic camera at the back is a codex recorder. It's not a Panasonic device. Sony, I mentioned already, the uh, Alpha 7S with uh, Atomos. That's what you see at the bottom right. Uh, I'll tell you more about that Atomos screen in a little while. And then they had this Ninja Star. It's a professional HD recorder that's three inches, and it costs $295. And it has audio inputs and VU meters and all kinds of stuff. So pretty amazing stuff. They did not need unclothed women. Uh, this you already heard about, the Sony IBM. IBM, by the way, was a participant in this research, 185 terabytes uh, on the cassette. Um, hardware for processing, supercomputing. There were Apple Mac Pros around, and Apple Mac Pro will do seven teraflops. Uh, for contrast, look at the bottom right, the Cray supercomputer in 1998. You were lucky if you could get one teraflop out of it. But above that, I'm showing the Devil computer that was shown at the show. It's 15.2 teraflops in the CPU and another 14 teraflops in the <coughs> GPU. Uh, who is making this? Jim Henson Studios. Now, once we start getting to this tremendous computer power, and if we can get it down to the point where we could stick it into the cameras or something, then we can do all kinds of interesting things in the cameras like uh, high dynamic range, reframing and refocusing in post, depth capture, increasing sensitivity, up resing, correcting lens aberrations, uh, higher frame rate by doing in betweening, or maybe even someday no lens whatsoever. Processing software, I'm not going to tell you a lot. Basically, I agree with automation news systems. Best way to tell if software works is using it. I wouldn't say the A software, but that's their writing. Um, but HEV splice, HEVC spice, splicing already available from General Dynamics. Um, HEVC real-time coding. Fraunhofer last year was showing 4K in 5 megabits with real-time decoding. This year they were showing real-time encoding. Effects and corrections. Just about everybody has all-in-one systems now. So if you buy DaVinci Resolve, you can do editing on it. Uh, if you buy some edit system, you can do grading on it. But here's the FCC saying you must do captions, captions on everything, and only Adobe Premiere of the significant systems had captions. So something wrong with the others. Um, the Academy of Motion Picture Television Arts and uh, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences came out with a color predictor app. I'll show you a little bit more about that later. And people were talking about grading while shooting, which means that you need accurate monitors. So here's the Academy color predictor app. And what's interesting is you can enter anything you're using. So, oh, I'm using this particular LED lighting fixture. Fine. What kind of filters do you have on it? Oh, here's the filters I have on the lighting. Here's the filters I have on the lens. Here's the camera I'm using. And it shows you, you can see kind of lines between the squares on the Macbeth chart. Uh, it shows you what kind of color you're going to get from those situations. Um, this was something uh, that Autodesk Smoke introduced. It's a subscription pricing plan now. You cannot buy Autodesk Smoke 2015. You can only subscribe to it. Uh, not necessarily something that you want to do. We'll have to see how that does. Processing control, you know, everyone says, oh, you can control this from your smartphone. You can control this from your iPad. But you can't really when you're doing a live show and the director says, quick, give me camera seven under graphic B but over graphic C. Uh, you need to have all that laid out for you. So here's a switcher that Panasonic introduced. And one of the things that even people who love Sony switchers or Grass Valley switchers said was fantastic was the little video displays in the buttons. So you could see instantly what you were cutting to, what clip you were getting, or something like that. Sound processing, Fraunhofer uh, showed Syngo, which is surround sound for mobile devices. Distribution at the left is a uh, small car with a satellite antenna on top. That satellite antenna is fully deployed as you see it. And the car can drive around and turn around and do all kinds of stuff, and the satellite antenna remains fully deployed. 
It's an array and it moves the beam around based on the array. Down at the bottom, a more traditional dish from uh, SysLive. It folds up so you can carry it in a backpack. Uh, bottom right is a uh, receiver for a camera control unit from Bradley, little tiny thing. Just above it is a transmitter for a GoPro Hero, no bigger than the camera. In the top middle, a set-top box complete with uh, an IP input, that's an RJ45 at the right, and the connector is an HDMI connector. So rather than plugging your TV into the set-top box, you plug the set-top box right into your TV. And then under that, tablet TV's device. And here's how that works. You're transmitting television programming. Um, tablets don't necessarily have television receivers. No problem, you go into this teapod and it converts your television programming into something that people can get on their tablets. TerraDeck had this TerraView system, so wireless monitoring of four cameras simultaneously on a tablet. Some opinions about the show, uh, here is Stephanie Savard, and she says it was the year everything changed, and here's Putman, and he said, ah, the show didn't really have quite the buzz. So basically, you went into the show with whatever your religion was, and uh, that's what give you, gave you your opinion about it. Here, of course, we have the cloud. <laughs> how cloud are you? Uh, how many people here have ever used Google? Goodness, everyone. How many people here use a Chromebook? One. Excellent. That's happened every time I've asked that question. One person has had a Chromebook. I was um, say, I, I bought it just to play with, but I don't actually use it. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, the Chromebook is something that depends on the cloud. So if you're not using a Chromebook, then you're not religious for the cloud. Um, that's OK. One cloud is very scary, and it doesn't matter whose cloud it is. You may recall Kim.com, who was the guy who had this thing called Mega Upload that uh, the U.S. said um, was doing copyright infringement, but he was putting his stuff on standard commercial cloud servers from Carpathia and Cogent, and so when the U.S. shut him down, they shut down access even to those servers. And so if you had your stuff on Carpathia or Cochin' servers, you couldn't get to it. So something to consider when you think about cloud. And there's other possibilities, storms and fires and so on. Nothing wrong with the cloud, but get two different ones. Presentation, this is oldish stuff, but some new takes on it. So. Um, Projectors as monitors, Christy and Epson. Epson was showing something. Boy, it sure looked like a monitor, but it was front projection. Um, LED walls as monitors. At the right there is a silicon core wall. Last year, they showed a magnolia panel. The magnolia has a 1.5 millimeter LED pitch. Uh, this year, they had a full wall, and you really had to walk up close to it to be able to see the LEDs. Uh, goggles as monitors, there's the Zeiss Cinemizer at the uh, bottom right, and notice it's only 870 by 500 pixels times two. And then accurate on-camera uh, monitoring, Small HD was one of the companies, Atomos again, so they certainly didn't need to have unclothed women. Uh, here's the Atomos system, there's the Atomos Shogun again on the Sony Alpha 7S and it's got an IPS screen and 3D color lookup tables, and how do you calibrate it? They have this little screen calibrator at the right. Uh, I think it's about 150 bucks. And so you buy that, you stick it on your screen, it calibrates, and you're ready to look at whatever you want to look at. Sichuan University had something they called Future Movie, and so there is someone watching an immersive movie at home on the theater seats, of which there are two. Here is NHK's um, 8K home display. It's a very, very large LCD. Um, ignore the LCD, but look down at the bottom. There are the footprints of where you're supposed to stand to look at it. <laughs> and if you had your living room couch there, then your knees would be hitting the cabinets. And finally, here is a remote control that NetUp 
introduced. Um, it has everything you need. You can do control alt delete on this remote control, which just proves that just because you can do something. So that was NAB. Any questions from anyone? Yes. The Lockheed Martin camera rig. Are they diversifying into production, or is that a smooth project that they were showing, or what is? I don't know what their um, purpose was. Uh, Stephen Stow was the head of the project, and um, he's available now. He's he's not with Lockheed anymore, and he can tell you about it. Um, they certainly wanted Hollywood to be interested in it. They uh, had eFilm do some processing on some of the stuff that they came up with. They showed it at the HPA Tech Retreat, uh, did a nice presentation on it. So yeah, they, they certainly were interested in having it used for Hollywood type stuff. But because it was a prism camera with really large sensors, gorgeous camera, spectacular sensitivity, spectacular resolution, I wish that any of the 4K cameras that were out there now were anything like it. And they did a few models of it, by the way. Yes, over there. Are there any V4 lenses that really resolve 4K? Are there any that actually resolve 4K? If you cut the bottom off a Coca-Cola bottle, it will have some amount of MTF at 4K. So you cannot say that something is a 2K lens or a 4K lens or an 8K lens or a 16K lens. They all have something out there. So you can't say an HD lens won't give you 4K or 8K or anything like that. But the MTF goes down and there are more lens aberrations and so on. So the only way of properly evaluating it is by looking at charts of MTF and aberrations and so on. And I'm an old enough timer that I recall when you could go to NAB and you could go into Schneider or Ingenue or whoever and say, can I see the MTF charts on the lens? And they would give it to you. Uh, now, MTF, what, huh? Uh, but, you know, for what it's worth, that uh, less than two to one wide angle zoom that Ari showed, which is a Zeiss lens, um, Ari is saying that it's good out to 6K, whatever that means. Any other questions? Yes. About the, uh, the drone cam, um, I, you know, I, I've seen people hesitate to use it for actual production because of some legality. Oh, the drones, yes. Um, the FAA at the moment uh, does not allow commercial use of drones. Uh, they allow personal use of drones, but not commercial. They are expecting to come up with a ruling, I think it's this July, that will say what they will allow and what they will not. But certainly a lot of people were using them in Las Vegas and sending them way up and so on. And you could hear the <laughs> all over the place. Any other questions? Yes. Those trends that you were showing for viewership earlier and how different they were depending on age group, do you think there's going to be a tipping point anytime soon? I mean, it's a, a tough question. Um, you know, if you ask me, will internet streaming eventually take over for television? I'll say yes. Uh, but if you ask me how long eventually is, I have no idea. It might be 100 years from now in which case we'll all be dead and it won't be our problem. But um, you were mentioning trends and I only showed you the latest figures from Nielsen, but if you look at previous figures, everything television oriented has been going up. The only thing that's been going down is wired cable connections. And wired cable connections are now going down at a slower rate than they were going down. Yes. The reduction in wired cable connections can be explained just by the number of people going broadband or, or the tail end of dish transition. You can certainly say that uh, some of it is people going to broadband, um, but a lot of it is people going to telco cable-like delivery, like the uh, AT&T U-verse or Verizon Fios, and a lot of it is increasing satellite. Satellite has been going up. But it's not people. I think not. Um, there, there are different opinions about that, but certainly 
the latest stuff that's coming is that pay is not going down. It's, in fact, going up. Any other questions? Cool.